Hi there, and welcome everyone to Developer Week 2022. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our next speakers, Andrew Columbi, co-founder and CTO, and Casey Alderetti, head of product at Tonic AI. It's a pleasure to see you guys. How's it going? Good. Thank you for the introduction. Awesome. You're welcome. And um, I'll let you go ahead and take it away. Okay. Well, uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining uh, my colleague, Casey, and me for our session today, or as I like to call it, our pre-production environment. This is, after all, our first conference of the year. We're testing out our setup, our workflows. We're making sure the features we've been excited to launch are ready to go. It's a concept you're all familiar with, I think, testing, staging, deployment. And it's a concept I'll dive into today in the context of a problem we're not talking about nearly as much as we should be. The software we build is growing more and more complex and it's rapidly increasing complexity uh, is causing an increase in complexity to one of the most critical tasks that we have today. It's an understatement actually to call it just a task given how difficult it has become to perform and given how much ongoing maintenance it requires. Yet many of us continue to use ineffective workarounds to keep up with this uh, tasks demands simply because we haven't had a better option. But that needs to change. Regulations and complexity have caught up with us and we need to collectively start talking about this problem. Let me share uh, some stats with you. Share my screen here. All right, hopefully you all can see that. First stat, data creation will be over 180 zettabytes by 2025. Sure, our lives have been in the digital space for over two decades, but data creation accelerated during the pandemic and now is on track for a compound annual growth rate of 20%. Next stat, 53% of companies have more than 1,000 sensitive files open to every employee. Put another way, in most companies, production data is still exposed to completely unnecessary risk. Stat number three, 69% of Americans lack confidence that firms will use their personal information in ways they are comfortable with. Is that a perception issue or are their fears actually justified? And this last stat I think brings it home, 55% of developers have difficulty creating consistent pipelines. So what's this problem that I'm talking about? This problem I'm talking about is of course test data. Test data today is broken. We have more data than ever, and consumers don't trust us to protect their personal information. And our current methods of sourcing test data are not effective, efficient, or safe. My point is that we are not given the opportunity to identify this as a problem because we have to keep moving forward and meet our release schedule so we do the best we can. We need our managers and team leads to know that we need tools specifically designed to do this well, that won't take weeks to build, that will protect uh, our customers' data, that will help us find bugs, simply put, that will allow us to do our best work. E-commerce eBay, e-commerce giant eBay, uh, recently built an entirely new data set from the ground up in their staging environment. Why? Because their test data was broken. The old ways of generating data did not do the job required in today's data environment. If eBay is willing to discuss the problem, shouldn't the rest of us be willing to do the same? I'll go into more detail on the eBay use case later, but first I want to share what you guys have told us throughout this conference. During developer week, we've been running a poll asking this question, what are you using for test data? And uh, here are the results so far. We've got 31% of you using production data as your test data, 38% using in-house workarounds, you're creating your own test data, and 31% of you using a third-party service. That tells me that the majority of us are still searching for a solution and need to be thinking differently. Whatever method you or your team are currently utilizing, it is important to acknowledge that this is not our fault. We are grappling with legacy data management systems, unprecedented amounts of data across vastly different database types. 
and data privacy regulations whose breadth and strength are expanding each and every year. This is not our fault, but it is our problem to solve. Okay, so before I go in a little bit more into why I'm so excited, I, I wanna share a little bit about my background. Prior to founding Panic, I worked at Palantir for close to a decade. And there I saw the same problem over and over. It goes like this. A field engineer reports a bug, product engineer can't reproduce it. It turns out the bug is endemic to the data and the product engineer has no access to the data. Well, I love solving problems, especially when it will make my teammates more efficient. So I took it upon myself to build a fake data set so these bugs could be reproduced. I told myself I'd time box this project to one week. It took me one week just to understand the nature of the problem. By week two, I realized I could not create fake data from first principles. I'd have to model it on the existing data to preserve utility. Three weeks in, I brushed off my graduate stats textbook. I was relearning Bayes' theorem. It took four weeks, and then I finally had a decent fake data set. But then, two months later, I found that the data set was being used in ways I'd never anticipated. Functional testing, scale testing, internal demos, and by teams I'd never worked with before. The fake data had delivered much more value than I expected. The experience taught me two things. One, this is way harder than you think it is. Since then, I've learned there are two kinds of engineers. Engineers who have never tried to create fake data and think, eh, it's probably pretty easy. And then engineers who've tried and know it's damn near impossible. Second thing I learned, it's also way more valuable than you think it is. I've built that data set to help support a particular client's integration with Palantir, but the synthetic data we created was secure and compelling enough that it got used by teams across the company. That data set even outlasted the client relationship. So fast forward five years, GDPR is a thing, CCPA is a thing, Netflix accidentally reveals some of their users' movie history and the now infamous Netflix prize. You can Google that one, it's on Wikipedia. Data leaks are in the news every other day. We need stronger data privacy. It's a fact of the world we're building. More data is being collected than ever before, and it's being used in more applications than ever before. Negligence isn't acceptable anymore. And the regulations are already here. And engineers need data. My excitement for this field is in finding that intersection, the crux that is between enabling engineers while protecting data privacy. Okay, so today's data and for the foreseeable future, future data is too complex to not embrace a new solution. And if we don't solve this problem ourselves, regulations will force us to. Bottom line, production data is simply not safe or in many cases not legal to use. Custom data is not efficient. The in-house systems are difficult to maintain. And uh, legacy data creation tools aren't up to the task. So hear me out. Let me tell you a story about an imaginary engineer, Emily, who works in DevOps for an imaginary happy shoppers retail empire. Engineer Emily is tasked with testing the new checkout feature of their online shopping portal to allow users to purchase goods from a variety of vendors in one transaction. Currently, she grabs a random 5% of their production data and runs a script she wrote to remove PII and generate strings that approximate the real user data. Using this data, her testing suite fails. It fails a lot. There's a couple reasons for this. First, the subset she grabs pulls from multiple databases and relationships in the data are being broken along the way. Also, there's a bunch of customer profile data in JSON blobs that's being captured in form fills and isn't being generated in a way that's consistent with the tabular data elsewhere in the database. Also, those random strings she put in to you know, fake real user data, well, they're making the workflows very hard to understand and represent when she's using them in her test environment. Simply put, staging was not up to par, or I, maybe more specifically, it's not up to production. This is not engineer Emily's fault, but it is her problem to solve. She needs a new solution. Okay, so let's maybe have some fun here. I'm gonna share my screen again, and I want us to brainstorm together 
a uh, what it would look like to create a system that can solve engineer Emily's task and our task, the task that we have every day. So what I'd like you to do is open up your chat tab if you don't already have the chat tab open. And uh, if you could just start putting in some ideas of what do we need to create a great fake generation tool. And if y'all are shy, don't worry, I, I came with a list. So, uh, you know, there, there, there's gonna be stuff either way. But if you have ideas, please put them in the chat right now. Don't be shy, it'll be more fun that way. Okay, so this first one, I'm gonna admit, you know, it, it's, it's from our own. Uh, detecting sensitive PII, PII and PHI. Not everyone is going to know the intricate details of your database and you need tools to help you identify where the sensitive data is. So having a, a system that's part of your overall test data, uh, test data ecosystem that can figure out where the PII is, it's extremely important. Another one is subsetting. Subsetting, you know, if you wanna be able to create test data sets, likely they're gonna to have to be a lot smaller than your production data set. Likely you're not gonna to wanna to put your production data set, you know, the same scale of data on a developer laptop or in your staging environment. So being able to reduce the size, incredibly important. I see we have a couple in the chat too. Uh, what else we got here? Yeah, collecting stats from prod and generating, it's exactly right. We need to be able to learn from production. It can't be a system that is um, unaware of the stories that data tells in production. Every database has stories in it. You know, the stories of a customer using your site, the story of a patient getting care. All these stories need to be um, learned from the system so that they can be put into the data. Uh, what else do we got? We have uh, schema change alerts. I'll, I'll just talk maybe about one or two more, but keep them coming. We'll, we'll fill out more if we want, if we have time to. Um, so schema change alerts, your database is going to uh, your database is going to change over time, right? You're gonna have new columns added, new tables added. And if PII leaks in through that mechanism, you're gonna need to know about it. You're gonna need to know upfront, hey, these things change. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe let's keep going for the sake of time here. Uh, and let's talk about, let's talk about a system that can solve this problem. You know, do we deserve a platform that can perform these tasks off the shelf? I think so. And to demo what we've just described, I'm going to invite my colleague, Casey, to the stage. And uh, yeah, hi, Casey. Hello, let me get my screen going here. Yeah. Uh, I'm Casey, okay. I'm the head of product at Tonic. Uh, and I am also very excited about this problem, although I haven't quite experienced the pain that Andrew has. Uh, I'm mostly excited about using privacy as an enabler for developer productivity. So really kind of unlocking that and then having that purpose to it. Um, and I'm going to take some of these criteria and, you know, reframe them. And, you know, where they were previously barriers to creating safe and useful test data, as Andrew said, they are now available with off-the-shelf solutions. And so I'm going to demonstrate one way that this could actually work for Engineer Emily. So we're gonna revisit Engineer Emily's main pain points that Andrew brought up, and we're gonna solve them with in-app capabilities. So we're gonna turn garbled data into realistic fake data with fit-for-purpose privacy. We'll prevent semi-structured data leaks with JSON masking, and the broken relationships will be resolved with referentially intact subsets. So let's go. So we are looking at the retail data for happy shoppers. Uh, customers, orders, vendors, addresses, lots of PII and other sensitive data. We're gonna focus on these at-risk fields that we wanna protect. So really narrowing in on those sensitive fields that have been detected. Let's take a look at the customer table and dive into Emily's first pain point, random strings that don't represent reality. So we're gonna start by recognizing that the data in here has more meaning than just what's represented by the database type, right? It's not just the metadata in the schema, it's not just a string, so it's actually a first name. And we're gonna actually describe what these data elements represent in the real world so that we can mask them appropriately. Okay, so moving on from simple strings, let's take a look at gender. 
This is what we call categorical data. So we could randomly pull these values from a category list, but in order to reflect reality, those ratios, those statistical properties of the data set, we're going to shuffle the values. And we're gonna preserve all of that realism that's present in the source, including a bunch of these nulls, right? So the data is messy in real life and we wanna have both the you know, main use case, but we also wanna represent some of those edge cases as well. Okay, so we're progressing here from capturing the meaning, the source distribution, and now we wanna think about the use case. Engineer Emily is testing the Happy Shoppers checkout process. We need to verify that we're pulling in the correct email from login and pulling that all the way through to checkout. So in this case, we wanna mimic the format of the original data. So uh, a randomized string here wouldn't help very much in terms of validating those test scenarios or troubleshooting and unwinding what's happening in the data. Okay, so we've built this model, right? We've got this sensitive happy shopper data right here. This is the sensitive part, Alexander Sanford. We've applied fit for purpose, privacy strategies, but what's really powerful here, and that took Andrew days to get right, maybe weeks, I don't know, with manual scripts, is this in-app real-time preview. So here we've turned garbage data into real fake data and Alexandra into Leonida. On to Emily's second problem. The customer profile is stored here in the row, okay? So this is a JSON blob embedded in the table Right, it's not straightforward. This is not something we can just simply substitute. It has complexity, structure, and meaning to it. And right now it's leaking through Alexandra's name, right? So we just masked that to Leonida. So let's take that complexity and richness of the source data into account. Let's uh, traverse that JSON blob, parse the data so that we can treat each element with the right privacy strategy. And to take that a step further, we'll do it consistently within the row so that Alexandra becomes Leonida. Okay, so finally, let's talk about how to mend those broken relationships across tables. So I'm gonna take a step back to get a sense of the overall database. So we've got, um, these are the tables, right? So we've got customers, sales, products, uh, vendors, and if engineer Emily is gonna grab a random 5% of customers, the test scenario is not gonna work if she has not also pulled through the right products and vendors. It won't make sense and that actually might crash. So we can keep that continuity by looking at the relationships between the tables. Ideally, these are defined as foreign keys in the database, but as we all know, the reality is some databases don't make use of or enforce the foreign keys. And sometimes foreign keys are not recorded in the database at all. That's actually embedded in the application logic. So in this case, I can see several relationships here, for example, between customers and the sales, the orders that they made. Um, but what I don't see is a relationship between the orders and the vendors table. So what I can do is to create a virtual relationship here to preserve that link. And so now I can see both the relationships and the foreign keys from the source database, as well as the one that I just told the application about. Okay, so engineer Emily has laid the groundwork for turning subsetting on. We have masking rules in place, we have the relationships identified, and now we can actually think about our goal, our use case here. What is the target? What's the right set of data? So engineer Emily has said that she wants 5% of the data so that it's a more manageable, minimized size, maybe to go on developer laptops, something they need remotely for testing. Now, it, this target could be defined more by the properties of the data itself. You know, for example, we might want to pull customers from Europe so that the offshore team can only access customers in their region, or as the support team gets interested, maybe they wanna troubleshoot a particular customer and they wanna trace that happy shopper record all the way through the entire database. So with the right relationships and the right target, you know, we're gonna get this preview of what it, tables are gonna be in the subset, what's gonna be out, and then we'll also get the corresponding proportion of rows. Again, we start with a preview for Emily's primary use case, and then we can start that iterative process of curating all the data sets that are needed. So we've solved all of Emily's problems, right? Well, at least for the first use case. As Andrew knows, the word about the value of realistic fake data will get out, and there's something about if you give a mouse a cookie, then they will have more data requirements. 
and they will, and they will be more complex. Um, now there's more advanced capabilities that we didn't touch on. Um, I'll mention this food for thought. You know, you can think about as you're evaluating or building your own synthetic test data capability, concepts like consistency, differential privacy, uh, even linking columns. So as Andrew mentioned, data tells a story. So um, I'll give an example here. Engine Emily knows that happy shoppers with a higher income are more likely to spend more. And so you can create those links um, so that the test scenarios actually reflect that, uh, you know, in, in their realistic scenarios. Now, in fact, engineer, oh, actually, um, yeah, as I say, engineer Emily's project, it's like so successful now, right? So word spreading even just beyond the original dev and test team to the data science department. Uh, it turns out that they have the same needs. They cannot access production data directly, but they need to build machine learning models for better recommendations. Their requirements are actually a little bit different, though, because they have a higher fidelity of data required to the extent that they actually need to run machine learning models on safe data that gives you the same insights as it does on the sensitive data. And so for that, we actually need a little bit of a different approach, um, which involves neural networks. So building actual embedded machine learning that's learning from your data and generating new synthetic data. These are capabilities that modern test data platforms provide. So beyond the table stakes of data privacy and the use case coverage, engineer Emily actually has to make this work in the real world. So what about all the messy plumbing bits like automation, change over time? For that, we need to think about the entire CI CD pipeline. Test data does not exist in a vacuum. So once the data masking rules, the subsetting rules, they're all in place, we can actually create fake data. Uh, but, but what comes right before this, right? Where does this fit in the process? You're likely gonna want to trigger this data creation maybe every time you spin up a database or concurrent with code check-ins so that you run a test suite. Or you could schedule refreshes so that test data is always up to speed with the latest production data. So you're gonna to wanna to orchestrate all of this with scripting. You're, you're unlikely to come in here and be clicking you know, this button. It's actually gonna be more likely a cron job calling the API or through something like Jenkins. And conversely, on the flip side, once we've created the test data, that's not the end point, right? We're not, we're not selling that test data. Uh, that's actually the starting point for whatever is next in the SDLC. So we wanna integrate into that. We can um, do something like a simple webhook, right? Like send Emily a Slack message when the job is complete, or we can create a Jira or Asana task so the developers can go validate the data or set up a GitLab action to trigger the next step in the build process. And of course, the data itself is not static either. Happy Shopper Inc. is constantly enriching the data set for a better user experience, adding columns and tables to support new features. So we're going to monitor and manage schema changes over time, right? It's less of an onboarding new data sets and more of a managing the diffs as you, know, you progress through production. And finally, I want to talk about doing all of this at scale across all of your use cases, dev, test, support, data science, across all of your databases. Of course, the relational ones, we've used Postgres here, SQL Server, but also data warehouses, data lakes, Snowflake, Databricks, NoSQL databases, MongoDB. And by now, it's more than Engineer Emily can manage alone. So we need to consider collaboration, role-based workflows, so that each team is getting access to the data that they need at scale. So that illustrates just some of the capabilities of Tonic, which was purpose-built to create safe, useful data to mimic real-world data at scale. And as I invite Andrew back or um, have Andrew come off of mute here. I will plug joining Andrew and me in the product demo room to ask us more about all of the things that I didn't get to go into, such as consistency, differential privacy, more about the DevOps workloads that we see. And um, now Andrew's going to actually get under the hood of the Tonic platform and dig into the whys behind the house. Great. Thank you so much for that demo. And yeah, I'm going to share my screen again here. All right. Cool. Yeah, let's get under the hood. Let's talk some technical details. Um, I'm going to just focus on a few things. We have a big list here. There's no way I could cover all of it. Uh, and we'll talk about um, relational integrity across tables and databases. And maybe we'll talk about some subsetting too. All right, let's get started. So, you know, 
I get a lot of questions about how we preserve the relational integrity across tables uh, and across databases. For example, suppose you're working with a database where we have credit card numbers as a primary key. Okay, so that sounds like a terrible idea and it is 100% a terrible idea, but you've probably seen some terrible ideas in production before. So this is the kind of challenge we need to deal with. It's a primary key that is also incredibly sensitive information. So we need a mechanism that can protect the true credit card number while being a valid key still for both the database and the application. And for this, we're gonna turn to some math to uh, solve the problem. Math to the rescue. How many times have you heard that? Okay, so what, uh, what do we need? We need a function that's going to take IDs, in this case, credit cards, and make new IDs, new credit card numbers. And uh, we can describe this mathematically, and I'm gonna use a lot of pictures like this, so I'm gonna kind of dig into what this picture means. Um, we're gonna, we can describe this mathematically as a function, F in this case, that goes from a domain back to itself. And what we're seeing here is the domain is the circle, like that's the whole set of all credit card numbers. And then the dots inside here are individual credit card numbers. Uh, so here's a credit card number that we're, that we're a, a mapping with F to a new credit card number. This is what we want. And uh, if you're looking for a function like this, there are certain mathematical properties of that function that it, we're going to need to have. The first one is that the function must be injective. This is math speak for no two inputs on that function can map to the same output. So here we have a picture of what, what we don't want, right? Picture of what we don't want is these two credit cards mapping to the same credit card over here. Why don't we want that? Because remember, these are gonna be used to protect primary keys. If I have two primary keys in my input database, going to the same primary key in the output database, that's gonna cause a primary key collision when I import this data into the database, meaning we'll lose rows. So we must have a function that is injective. The next thing is it must map to the same space. It's going from credit cards to credit cards. Can't go credit cards to some credit cards and some social security numbers or something like that. That's, that's what we have here. Uh, this would be uh, outside the space of credit card numbers. So if you have, an injective function that maps from itself, uh, from a domain onto itself. This is, uh, means that the function is also surjective, which means we need a bijective function. And the last thing we need is that it not be easily reversible, right? That's the whole point. We're gonna create a new ID, a new credit card, and that credit card is going to be, uh, you know, difficult to figure out what the, impossible to figure out what the original credit card number was. Okay. so. If you're mathematically inclined as, as I am, you might be thinking to yourself, what such function could exist? And the answer is right at your fingertips. It's actually encryption. Encryption is a great way of, uh, of, of, of working with this problem. Um, we know that, that encryption is injective. We know this intuitively because you can decrypt things, right? If you can decrypt something, then you know every output has exactly one input associated with it. We also know that encryption maps from a domain onto itself. For example, AES encryption, which we will use in this example, AES encryption maps from 128-bit blocks to 128-bit blocks. We also know encryption is not easy to reverse. That I think we can all agree on. And we know that uh, there are great open source implementations already out there that we can use available for free. So that's a great starting point, but it's not gonna be enough. There's a problem with using AES. AES maps 128-bit block to one, 128 bit block. Credit cards are not 128 bits. Credit cards are 16 digits. It's a different sized domain. So we need a function actually that goes from 16 digit credit cards to 16 digit credit cards. Okay, so how are we gonna do that? Well, there's two tools that we're gonna use to create uh, this function from AES. So AES is gonna be our starting point and we're gonna add layers to AES to create a function that maps from credit card numbers to credit card numbers. The first step is to employ a Feistel network or otherwise known as a Feistel cipher. A Feistel cipher lets you use a, um, use a fixed size bit block encryption like AES and create another encryption function 
for a smaller domain of your, of your choosing. You can pick like, I want, rather than bit blocks of 128, I want bit, bit blocks of seven. Or in this case, I have an example here, bit blocks of five. Here's a five length bit block that uh, has, you know, it has five bits in it and the function applies to it and it you creates a new five bit bit block. So uh, that's our first tool is the Feistel cipher. And um, this gets us close but not all the way. So I can pick a, uh, now that I can pick whatever size bit block I want, I'm going to pick a bit block of 47 bits. Why 47 bits? Because it's just big enough to cover the entire space of credit cards. There are more, but not a ton more. There are more, uh, bit, more numbers, more values in the set, more elements to the set. That's the word I'm looking for. More elements to the set of 47 bit arrays then there are 16 digit numbers. But that's a kind of like, okay, so we're close, but we're not all the way there, right? Now I have uh, this function F, which operates on B47, bit blocks of 47 length, uh, of length 47. And that domain is larger than the domain of 16 digit credit card numbers. So I can put the 16 digit credit, credit card numbers inside B47. And now I have a function that operates on uh, on well, it operates on B47, but part of that is operating on D16. So I can apply this function to an element in D16, and we're so close, but we're not quite there yet because I might end up mapping to D16, but I might actually end up mapping to B47, right? Like F operates on a space bigger than D16. So it could end up outside D16 after all that. So we're not quite there yet. We need one more ingredient, and then we will have our function from D16 to D16. And that ingredient is called cycle walking. Um, this is the algorithm of cycle walking kind of just laid out there. As a, as a pseudocode, it's probably harder to understand than just a picture. So how does cycle walking work? It just says, let's take, because F maps from a domain onto itself, you can take F and apply it again onto the output. So here what we have is F applied to D16, an element of D16, we find that it goes outside of D16, lands in B47. What do we do? Let's just apply F again. We apply F again, it goes to another spot in B47. Okay, let's apply F again. Eventually, we will land back in D16. Now, there's two questions you might have. Well, uh, first, are you sure? Like, how do you know it's gonna land back in, in, uh, in D16? And that's a reasonable question. I, I wouldn't say that it's, you know, uh, entirely obvious that this is true, but, um, I think you can convince yourself if you think about two facts. One, that this function operates on a domain onto itself. And secondly, that it's injective. So no two elements can map to the same thing, which means that in the end, you are only going to follow cycles in, in this. Uh, you're going to cycle through every single element if you just keep going. You keep applying F, you will go through every single element in this data set. And eventually that means going back to D16. So that's the first question, are you sure? Uh, and the answer is yes, I'm sure. Uh, and if you're still not sure, I get it. Uh, you can totally look this up on Wikipedia, and maybe spend some more time noodling on it. Second question you might have is, well, how long is it gonna take? I mean, I just did three steps here, but maybe it'll take a ton of steps to cycle back into D16. And for this, there is some good news too. Because uh, we've created B47, bit of length 47, to be slightly bigger than D16, we know that um, there's going to be a probabilistic bound on the number of steps it takes to go back. And we can be more, even more specific because B47 and the space of B, like B46, B47, B48, B49, they always grow in doubles, right? This is a bit array. Every time I add another bit, I'm doubling the size of the set. So I know it's maximally bounded by 2x the size. B47 is no more than 2x the size of D16. Probably it's actually like a closer fit than that, but at worst it's 2x the size. So probabilistically, I can feel confident that this will close, this will loop, will finish within two hops. Okay, so that's this algorithm kind of described in pictures and giving you some intuitions for why this algorithm works, why this algorithm is sane. Um, this whole thing that I described, I didn't invent this, I'm not even gonna come close to claiming such a thing, this is format preserving encryption. You can find it on Wikipedia. Uh, there's a you know, great article. I mean, the implementation that 
I've worked on at this point and others uh, at Tonic have worked on comes from reading Wikipedia and learning about it. Um, but you can use it for, it's a great toolbox. I mean, you can use it for so many things. We used it for credit cards just now, but you can use it for things like email addresses. You can use it for social security numbers. You can use it for random strings. You can use it for integers of various sizes, like a 32-bit int. Now, how many databases have 32-bit int or 64-bit int as a primary key somewhere in them? Oh, like basically all of them, right? <laughs> um, and so, you know, this is a great tool that you're gonna need if you wanna be able to do this really, really well. Okay, next technology I wanna talk about. This one's also super important. How do we do database subsetting? So what is database subsetting? Let's start with that. Database subsetting is shrinking a database while maintaining referential integrity. So as an example, let's say, give me 5% of my users and all of the associated metadata with those users. So let's, let's uh, I love pictures. It seems clear now that I love pictures. And uh, let's do some pictures on this one too. So. Here are two tables. I got a users table and I have an events table. I wanna get 5% of users and all their associated metadata. Great, let's start with users. Let's get 5% of users. Here are a handful of users I picked. I've got a green user, a blue user, a pink user, and now I need to get their metadata, no problem. Go over to events, get the events associated with the blue user, get the events associated with the pink user, the green user, et cetera. This is what we mean by subsetting. And what we specifically don't mean, what we want to avoid, is getting any like red user, you know, a red event, I should say. This red event doesn't associate with any users. So if we took this event, we would break referential integrity. Okay, so that is what is subsetting. Next question is, well, why do you want to subset? And maybe this is self-evident, but I think there are a couple of use cases that might not be so obvious that I'll talk about right now. The first one that is probably most obvious is shrinking a production data set. You want to be able to put the, the you want to be able to put test data in your staging environment Maybe your, test, uh, your staging environment doesn't have as much hardware as your dev environment. Maybe you wanna put it on a developer laptop. Another example of where you might need to shrink things. Um, another example of using subsetting, focusing on a few specific rows to reproduce a bug. Maybe you know one customer has an issue. If I can just get the rows from that customer, that'll help me narrow down what's going on. The last one is maybe sharing a database with others when they're not allowed to see the whole thing. Maybe you need to share just the data on American users for your American test team or European users for your European test team, that kind of thing. All right, I described what subsetting is. We talked about why we want to subset. Let's talk about some approaches to subsetting. And my goal here is to give you uh, just a sense of the challenge. We're not gonna be able to get into how to solve it exactly. There's a, I've given uh, some longer talks than this on that. And uh, there's certainly no time in this but I wanna give you a taste of it. So here's the taste. First approach we're gonna do is uh, what I call just random subsetting. We're, we want 5% of users, let's just apply that idea to every table. So we take 5% of users, we get these users, we take 5% of addresses, we get these addresses, et cetera, et cetera. Now there's an obvious problem here, right? Um, I got orange events, but I have no orange users. I have this gray address, but there's no gray user that needs that address. It's not connected. The data is broken from a referential integrity perspective. So random subsetting, I mean, we kind of all expected this to not work, but now we know for sure this does not work. Uh, what else can we do? Well, our intuition is probably telling us the problem with the last thing we did is that we didn't respect the foreign keys. And uh, perhaps I should have said that earlier. This example, you know, we've got four tables here and the arrows represent foreign keys between them. Okay, so these are the foreign keys. So uh, with that, let's imagine following the foreign keys. Let's use the foreign keys as a guide of what to get. So I'm gonna get some users. Here I've got uh, my 5% of users. Now when it comes to addresses, let's look at what addresses the users have that I, uh, the users need that I have so far. Let's get just those addresses. Let's get just those users or regions. And uh, then what about events? Well, events is actually like an interesting question mark here. And um, I'm just gonna bring this up because it's sort of the first spot where you get into some complexity. Events is optional. At this moment, the database is fine, right? We've got users, we've got addresses, a region. It's referentially intact. You can load this into a database. But from a test perspective, it's probably not what you wanted, right? Like if you're gonna do testing, you need users that have events. Otherwise you can't test all your workflows. So 
while it's referentially intact, it is not suitable for testing. And what this means is that you're in a position where now you get to make a choice as a developer or as a person developing this subsetting application, you get to make a choice. What data should I put in events? And anytime you have a choice to make, that means like, oh, algorithm might do one thing or another. Like, what do I need to do here? It means you, it becomes an art instead of a science. And so developing over years, the intuition and heuristics about what events to take here is actually a, a bigger problem than you might expect. For now, we're going to kind of gloss over that. It's like, okay, fine. Let's just get the events for the users that we have right now. But know that this was a choice. And when you make choices in algorithms for your users, you are potentially creating, uh, a, you know, you're creating a, a moment of tension where things might go one way or another. Okay. So that's all well and good. Simple database, great. Problem, real database, not so great right? This simple algorithm that I've described of just sort of, oh, we'll go from one table to the next. It's fairly straightforward. Doesn't work in a real environment. I mean, even this picture doesn't really describe the true chaos of a production database. We've got hundreds of tables and not just one database, right? Um, so what you find, you know, the, the first thing that I, I said is that it's problematic is this events table, right? The events table is a problem because you have to make a choice. Here's another place where you have to make a choice. Let's say I'm starting with this table right here. Which table do I do next? You have to make a choice. And when you're making choices, it's difficult. The algorithm becomes more complex. So let's talk about that. Real DBs, real problems. Simply following foreign keys is ambiguous in many situations, and I call this the path problem. So let's go through two examples of paths that we can take in this really simple database, three tables, that's all you need. And you can show how the path you take really matters. Okay. Let's start with our example, 5% of users. We take 5% of users. Now we have a choice. Do we go to events or do we go to super events? Which table do we get next? Let's just say we chose to go to super events next. So we get these super events and now we have no choice. All of a sudden we have no choice. We have to take certain events, right? Because super events has a relation to events. If I'm gonna make this database referentially intact, there are rows I must take on events. So I take those events. And what you found now, let's just, rename these. Imagine this was uh, purchases and you're like a marketplace. And these purchases that you have, have two user IDs per purchase. You have the seller ID and the buyer ID. And because you've now incorporated potentially additional users from the original set, you might need to revisit users and add additional users. So I've added additional users. This means I need to get more super events. Now I need to get more events. Now I need to get more users. And this is where things go bad. So once again, when you have to make a choice, things can go south. And uh, the other choice I wanna illustrate is, you know, I said there were two choices. We could go to super events first. Now let's imagine we go to events first. When we're visiting events in this moment, we have perfect information about what users we have, what data we already can support. So we know that if we go to events first, we can get just the events for the users we've already imported. Now, when we look at super events, we're in the same position. We're in this position of having all the information we need to be able to make a smart decision about what super events to take. So all I wanted to do here is illustrate once again that the choice is difficult and matters. And this was just three tables. Imagine this with a thousand tables. And how are you going to make the choice right at every time? Obviously, a human can't do it. You need a machine to do it. Okay. That's as far as I can go for now. We run out of time, but uh, we can definitely do more in the Q&A if you're interested. And so I'm gonna move forward and tell you about some real world use cases. And let's start with eBay. eBay in three bullets, eight petabytes of data, 4,000 developers in different departments, each department with different testing needs. And their number one concern was customer data privacy. The eBay problem, staging was broken. They saw two options, eliminate staging altogether or diagnose and fix it. Customer data privacy is their top priority. So eliminating staging and working with production data was not an option. Therefore, staging had to be fixed. And staging data was a key ingredient that was missing. Let's take a minute to absorb that. The giant platform used by millions of users a day all over the world committed to not only using production data and uh, they could not 
effectively created in-house. They committed to doing it, but they couldn't do it in-house. This is a problem we all share. It's complex, it's not our fault, but it is a, our problem to solve. And if eBay needed help solving it, then it should be okay for the rest of us to need help too. Okay, so back to eBay, where we had a twofold problem. They needed to create realistic data to represent the vast number of scenarios and stories in their data. They needed to shrink their massive eight petabyte data set down to a manageable size for their staging environment. To solve this, the eBay team tried to create data in-house, but it was too robotic. It wasn't complex enough to represent all the stories in their database. However, by incorporating the, uh, by incorporating the Tonic platform, they were able to subset eight petabytes down to one gigabyte data, uh, data sets for use by developers in a number of use cases. Subsetting was key to their success. Some of the other features they rely on include consistency, JSON blobs, schema change alerts, auditing, access control, all the things that we talked about earlier, right, with uh, and engineer Emily. And by the way, they're not doing this just with relational databases. They are also doing this with their document stores, for example, MongoDB. Okay, so onto this slide. Uh, not such a humble brag, but here is what Director of Engineering at eBay, Srikanth, had to say. Nothing that we tried in-house is comparable to what we're doing now with Tonic. It's a game changer both in terms of automation we can achieve, as well as on-demand function validation targeting specific use cases with precise data that we need. The point here isn't that they used Tonic, although I am personally thrilled that our work is benefiting them. The point is that they identified the problem and found an appropriate tool to get the desired result. Okay, I'm gonna close with one more use case. Everly well. You've probably heard of at-home healthcare testing kits from the health tech company Everly Well. You may have even used their at-home COVID tests. I know I actually used their at-home COVID tests and it was this weird moment of like, I'm their customer and they're my customer. Um, but, but had you heard of them prior to 2020? At the start of the pandemic, they were an 80 employee company. Over the course of 2020, they grew to a thousand, over a thousand. Scaling up became both a point of pride and a point of pain. Their team growth was exponential only because their customer growth was so incredibly rapid, which translated to a staggering amount of growth in sensitive health customer data. Because their production databases were constantly changing, their testing environments and DevOps processes were not able to keep the pace. EverlyWell's developers were losing precious time spinning up sandbox environments and manually creating test databases. Releases were stymied. Bottom line, their in-house solution simply wasn't scalable. The Tonic platform helped EverlyWell eliminate bottlenecks and automate their sandbox environments with, uh, by creating efficiencies and giving three of their full-time developers back time to work on other projects. And the greatest value for the team was experiencing, uh, that it's experiencing such an exponential growth was they went from one release a day to as many as five a day. It even sped up employee onboarding. Senior DevOps engineer Sebastian has this to say, since we started using Tonic, I've seen several developers push new features to production their first week on the job. Again, this is not, our problem, uh, not a problem we've created for ourselves, but it is our problem to solve. But to do so, we have to first identify that we have a problem. Okay, that concludes this session. Casey and I are so grateful to uh, be able to share this stuff with you guys around fake data today. Um, if the possibility of these tools excites you as much as it does us, please join me in the product demo room for an extended Q&A. Click on the session chat tab and you'll see a link to the demo room. Uh, while you're there, if you're you know, shy about what you wanna ask me, let me give you three prompts of what you might ask me. What percentage of developers notice the difference between the fake data and production data in a blind experiment at ITDM? How did eBay shrink their eight petabyte production data set down to one gigabyte data sets tailored for their staging environment? And last question, did it really take Kin Insurance less than an hour to create a representative coherent subset for development and testing? Again, 
Thank you so much for taking the time to invest in this conversation with Casey and me. Please follow me to the demo room via the link in the chat room uh, where I will welcome all of your questions. Thanks.